Well, welcome again to the Big C in Me podcast. My name's Andy Robinson. I'm a leader of Life Spring Church, the founder of Waymaker International Charity and Zambian MGO. I'm also a blogger, and you may know me from social or video media as the Big C in Me. In January 2023, I was diagnosed with stage four bowel cancer. And as part of that journey, I've met some amazing people. Some of them were already good friends. Others were people that I briefly met in the past. And some were new friends that I've made since being diagnosed. And all of them have been an incredible support to me in so many different ways. And I hope that having them chat on this podcast, me explaining my journey, can be a support to others who are journeying this Uh, difficult time of cancer. This week I'm going to continue my own story. If you have not caught up on the previous two podcasts about this I'd encourage you to do so but we are got to a point where we were really excited that we've been given a consultant appointment just four weeks after my last chemo tablet um, with a pre-op immediately afterwards and this was for my liver resection and we had high hopes that it would be a favourable consultancy appointment, a very short wait for surgery. We've been praying for that kind of favour and speed and we'd seen it on many occasions. However, all of that quickly faded as we met with the consultant and excitement rapidly turned into disappointment. Although we'd met the consultant surgeon before, this time it was like meeting a completely different man. At our first meeting, he was empathetic, understanding, compassionate. He seemed genuine and we were expecting more of the same. But instead, uh, we met what seemed to be the complete opposite. He seemed preoccupied, ill-prepared and lacking in any compassion at all. At least, that's what it felt like to us. Now, it was four o'clock on a Friday afternoon and we all have bad days and weeks and he's only human like you or me. So I ended up putting it all down to that. But in the moment, it was very upsetting, especially for Hazel. Where the Macmillan nurse had said that the chemo had worked and the operation was going ahead, the surgeon said that the chemo had not worked anywhere near as well as they had hoped and went on to explain that there was the possibility that they could open me up and see a different picture to the scan, which could mean they do not cut out the cancer, but just sew me back up. We then asked one or two questions, finishing with, when will the surgery be? And he dropped the bombshell that surgery would not be till mid-March or even April. It was the 16th of February. The chemo had not worked all that well and now we're going to have to leave it untreated for another month or even two. We couldn't believe it. When we asked why so long, he responded with some very complicated uh, explanations that was way beyond my intelligence to understand, which he summarised with the assurance that it would not make any difference to the result. He seemed at that moment, to me anyway, to be someone not used to being questioned. To be honest, we left the consultation confused upset, disappointed and none the wiser. In fact, we were more confused than when we went in because on the way in, we'd been led to believe that the chemo had worked, which was why the surgery was going ahead. Now we understood that the chemo had not worked that well and that the surgery was going ahead to see what could be done once they'd opened me up. No one was saying very much at all, so we could only wait until we got a surgery date through the post. But who knew knew when that would be? We've been expecting another positive meeting with the surgeon and hoping for positive news and a surgery date in the next two weeks, just like the last time we met with him. However, the reality was disappointingly different. We were met with negative news, less than compassionate bedside manner and no clue what the future would hold. The Bible tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick, meaning that when our expectations are not met or completely dashed, it's a sadness that can fill our hearts. That was certainly a possibility for me. To be honest, it was a reality for Hazel. She left that meeting feeling completely sideswiped. Her hopes of a good round of chemo to shrink the liver lesions, followed by a quick liver resection to remove the cancer, and then a four-week recovery all just went up in smoke. Once again, by the grace of God, I found myself full of supernatural peace and was pretty much unfazed by it all. Yeah, I was disappointed that the surgery uh, could be up to two months away, but in my spirit, it still felt well with my soul. 
It would be easy in those circumstances to be angry with the consultant for being so apparently lacking in compassion, abrupt and devoid of any concern for us. But because of that supernatural peace that I had, I just felt compassion for the man. It was 4 p.m. on a Friday and we had no idea what kind of day he was having, no clue about what was going on in his world or what life challenges he was facing. And I said to Hazel as we walked and talked on the way back to the car that maybe he was just having a bad day at the end of a really bad week and that we should find grace for him in our hearts. After all, at some point in the next two months, he was going to have his hands on the inside of my chest operating and we needed to be in a place of peace towards him when that happened. I think Hazel's initial reaction was in the same vein, although not as extreme as the people who commented on my TikTok post about this interaction, many of them ranting about my rights, saying it was my right to be treated respectfully and compassionately. However, there was not one reply when I said, but it is also my right to be gracious, gracious, even merciful to whom I want to. And so I'm choosing to see the best in this man, to believe that he was just having a bad day. As we patiently waited for the letter telling us when the surgery would be, we were told that after a week we'd find out. However, the week passed and we'd heard nothing. And so I decided to call my Macmillan nurse, leaving a message to see if she could inquire on my behalf and discover what was happening. She called back the next day to say that she'd just spoke, spoken to the surgical admissions administrator and that my surgery would be in two weeks' time. Again, the goodness of God came in a speedy surgery date, just three weeks after the consultation, rather than the eight weeks or two months that it could easily have been. I've learned through all of this that there is a, a power in remaining thankful. So often when things are not going well, when the big picture seems so impossible, we so easily miss the small wins that God gives us in those trials. And because we miss them, we miss out on the opportunity to be thankful. In the New Testament, we're told to rejoice at all times, pray without ceasing, give thanks in every circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There are no caveats, there are no get out of jail free cards we can play because of our circumstances. Cancer does not qualify me for a free pass here. Neither does other sickness or circumstances, persecution or difficulty. We are told to give thanks in all circumstances. Now, to avoid any doubt, this does not mean that we give thanks for our circumstances or just accept them lying down. We pray just as the Apostle Paul does, asking for the circumstances to be removed. But in whatever circumstance, we are to look for the small wins and remain thankful because God is good all the time. There's always some demonstration of his goodness in our circumstances, however dire, however small, that we can be thankful for. God's will for us, regardless of our personal situation or circumstances, is that we are a thankful people. And I was thankful that my surgery date was only a three-week wait, not the eight weeks it could have been. And that said, I have to confess that it was hard to be thankful for the two-week liquid-only diet the surgeon put me on to reduce the fatty deposits on my liver before surgery. Soon enough, the date for surgery came around and I was admitted the night before and due to be first in the queue for the operating theatre in the morning, which was great news. However, the reality on the day was somewhat different and I didn't go into surgery until the afternoon due to an emergency case coming in. I met the anaesthetist who was going to give me an epidural once I was under from the general anaesthetic and they explained what an epidural would, would do uh, and it'd give me the, the best possible pain relief post-surgery, which I have to say I am a great fan of. They walked me into the operating theatre and I got up on the table and they inserted a cannula into my hand and administered the general anaesthetic and the rest just became a blur as I very quickly drifted off to sleep. I woke from the surgery in the ICU some hours later to see Hazel's reassuring face looking down at me. I was in some pain at that moment, but felt absolutely freezing due to the point of physical shivering from head to toe. 
Apparently post anaesthetic shivering to give it its official name is quite common, although I'd never experienced it before. It was quite disturbing in the moment and not being fully compass mentis due to the anaesthetic didn't help either. As I understand it now, this occurs because parts of your body have been exposed to a cool environment during the operation. Equally, epidural and spinal uh, anaesthetics, which is what I'd had, open up blood vessels to the skin, which increases blood flow to the skin and increases heat loss. Who knew the things I would learn that I never thought I would need to know? Sadly, it was past the very strict visiting times in the ACU and Hazel was only there because I think she kicked off a bit of a stink and they let her in. So she very quickly had to leave and I was once more on my own, feeling like I was freezing to death in pain and not fully awake from the anaesthetic. Some time later, and I have no idea how much time later, as I was drifting in and out of sleep, the surgeon came to see me and he explained that he'd come back in the morning and repeat what he was about to say as he was aware that I may not fully remember the conversation, but he wanted me to understand the outcome of the surgery as soon as possible. He gave me the short version on that occasion, which could only be described as disastrous and devastating. The surgery was a failure. He had opened me up. He'd removed the gallbladder in preparation for the liver resection and the removal of multiple lesions on my liver, only to discover that the cancer on my liver had grown far more than they'd anticipated. There were no, no new sites of cancer on the liver, but the existing sites had grown considerably, meaning uh, were they to remove them, there would not be enough of the liver remaining for it to recover. They therefore had no choice but to abort the liver resection and sew me back up. The liver is a fantastic organ as it's the only one that regenerates. They can cut parts of it away and it will grow back. It's incredible. Technically, the maximum they can remove is two thirds, but as I understand it, they don't like to remove more than 50%. And in my case, the chemo had not shrunk the tumours enough for them to be safely removed and leave enough of the liver behind for it to grow back. So the only option was to abandon surgery. The news was devastating. I'd endured major surgery. I got a 30 centimetre or 12 inch scar, which was stapled up not sewn up and it looked like a massive zipper to be honest. My gallbladder had been removed to allow for the river resection but as that procedure didn't happen as they'd intended that had all been for nothing. Now while you can live and function normally without a gallbladder and I know several people who've had it removed I would prefer to have kept it if there was no good reason for it to go. The loss of my gallbladder, the ongoing pain that would need to be managed, the physiotherapy of recovery, having 35 staples removed, the month of rehabilitation at home were all incredible disappointments. However, they all paled into insignificance when compared to the fact that the cancer that had invaded my body was still in it. The news that after another brutal round of chemo and now major surgery, they were no further forward than we were six months prior. It was so disappointing. This was nothing short of disastrous, yet as disappointed as I was, as sad as I was, I was never once anxious. That peace that defies understanding was still there. In my lowest moment, my very own shadow, valley of the shadow of death, if you like, I knew the comfort of God and the presence of Jesus right with me there in the ICU. Over the coming five days in the hospital and the weeks of rehab at home, there are occasions when my mind wandered to the many things we didn't know. Even after the surgeon came back in the morning and explained the history of the surgery again, he was unwilling to comment on any future prognosis, saying that my oncologist would need to go through that with me. The only problem was I didn't have an appointment and I had no clue when one would be arranged. Therefore, there was this massive gap in our understanding and too many unanswered questions. Was the liver now inoperable? Would it ever become operable? And if not, what course of action could be taken instead? Was this one of those situations where having opened you up, they realise that there's nothing more that they can do for you and it would therefore be time to get your affairs in order and get measured up for a wooden overcoat? Hopefully, things would not be that serious but would I now just be chasing the cancer, responding to its advances as best I could to extend my life for as long as possible? Was the battle 
naturally speaking, unwinnable? Are we now just looking to delay the inevitable as long as possible while knowing all the while that my clock was well and truly ticking? We didn't know, nor would we, for another three weeks. Inevitably, if you allow it, your mind will lean towards the worst case scenario. In truth, this could be a bump in the road. It may be that we need to do another round of very intensive chemo and then have another go at the liver resection. And all of this is just a slight delay in, in the bigger scheme of things. However, your mind will always tend towards the negative. And for me, that was the thought of imminent death. I found that when there are too many variables to make sense of the future quickly, then it's time to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. This was one of the tools I learned in therapy when I was struggling with depression, and I could now implement it again in this situation. This is how I know God wastes nothing and he gets you ready. In this situation, I had the choice to allow my mind to disappear down these many rabbit holes that these questions had opened up, knowing that they would only lead to some dark places. Or I could choose to think about the truth that God is good, that he is honourable and trustworthy and true, that it's him who has numbered my days and not cancer. The number of my days he has ordained for me has not suddenly changed because a surgeon's opened me up and seen something he was not expecting. God determined every day that I would live before I was even born and that has not now somehow changed. If I'd been confident of this truth before surgery then I could choose to remain convinced of it afterwards. I'm not saying it's easy and I have to say that having the supernatural peace of God helps but it still remains a choice. I can't say that in every moment of every day of every week of every month I have never had a dark thought or entertained some negative what ifs but by the grace of God they were fleeting and much of the time I choose to remain in that place of peace with God. Despite all of this disappointment and uncertainty and pain, there are always opportunities to demonstrate the goodness of God by taking an interest in the people around you and not making it all about you. Whilst I was in the intensive care unit, I was cared for by a male nurse uh, who only had one other patient to look after. I suppose they thought I'd be too much of a handful. No, but seriously, the care was outstanding in the ICU and the nurse to patient ratios were terrific. I was hooked up to many, so many machines, bags and tubes that required very regular monitoring. It meant that we chatted frequently about my medication, my progress and whatever else came up. However, towards the end of his shift, I just randomly asked him if he had any plans for that night. And to my surprise, he pulled the curtain around my bed and he said, I don't normally do this, but there's something about you that makes me feel I can talk to you. He then proceeded to tell me that his wife's father died in the early hours of that very morning. And he explained that it had been weighing on his mind all day. And he said, it's just so random that you would ask about my evening. And I've not spoken to anyone else at all about this. So thank you. Whilst I couldn't pray for him or his wife in that moment because he was on duty, I could assure him that I would pray for him that night and over the coming two days that he had off. I love those God moments that are almost always there if we stop long enough to notice people. All too often we're wrapped up in our own situations and problems that we don't notice that the people around us may well be going through it too. A simple question may open up an opportunity for the gospel and a demonstration of God's goodness. And those moments come in all sorts of shape and sizes. For me, laughter is a great medicine, but also a great icebreaker. While struggling in the ICU, I encountered one of those you could not make this up situations that genuinely made me laugh out loud. When ordering my evening meal, I spotted the all day breakfast on the menu. And so when the breakfast guy woke me up the following morning by asking what I wanted for breakfast, I immediately said, the all day breakfast, please. And he replied, we don't do that in the mornings. And I genuinely could not stop laughing that the all day breakfast was not all day, nor was it even available as breakfast. 
But even this comedy moment opened up an opportunity to connect with the catering staff, as from that day on, I referred to him, the breakfast guys as all day breakfast guy, which meant every morning we could have a smile and a laugh together. After a few days, I was taken from the ICU and put on a ward, which meant I could be going home soon. Sadly, the time on the ward was a very different experience to being in the ICU. The level of care was poles apart, with nurses on the ward spread far too thin. This became apparent when I needed to have an NG tube inserted in my nose, down my throat, to my stomach, as I was constipated as a result of all the painkillers, and they needed to aspirate, which is like remove the contents of my stomach from time to time to prevent me from throwing up. However, this took three attempts, which was horrible. The gagging as the tube goes past your throat is horrible. And because the nurses were in a rush trying to get it done quickly was not helping the process at all. I've had an NG tube inserted before and whilst not all that pleasant, it was not a difficult drawn out procedure like this one. However, eventually they did get it in and through the next day or two, it did prove to be helpful. I was then discharged, sent to the patient lounge, the discharge lounge, as they call it, uh, for what turned out to be a five hour wait for my take home medicine to be dispensed. And for all that time, I was in pain to the point where the nurses had to get another prescription for oxycodone as the wait was so long and no one seemed to know how much longer it would be. Eventually, however, we were able to leave and get home and begin what would be a month of rest and recovery from this major, albeit pointless, as it turned out, operation. Well, I'll leave it there for this uh, episode, but please do tune in um, for the next one where we will continue the story. Please tell your friends and people that you know you think this may be helpful for um, about the podcast. We'd love you to recommend it. Give us a like and subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcast from. So till next week, goodbye. Goodbye.